Welcome to the Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Jim, your take on 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 uh, on what's going on here in terms of the uh, we talked about the human shields, but uh, in terms of what's happened to the memory of the Holocaust. Yeah, I think that's true. Um, it, you know, uh, the Jewish people say, uh, never forget, mm-hmm. and uh, we certainly should not forget the Holocaust and the atrocities of the Holocaust. Um, but beyond that, I think if Israel is based just on the Holocaust, that's not, a, that's not a firm foundation. And I think we have to understand that there's much more to it than that. We've discussed the biblical uh, claim, the historic claim. There's also legal claims, and by international law. Um, Israel has legitimacy according to, it, to international law. Uh, that gets a little far afield from the discussion of the Holocaust, um, but I do think it's relevant that okay, we understand. Okay, why, why don't you walk us through some of the uh, background because and, – and let me let me fill in here as, because it's an important transition. You know, part of what goes on here, and I said we would discuss this, is related to the terminology of what you get. So, for example, you know, from the Palestinian side, you get the idea Israel is occupying the land. You get that kind of language. Um, uh, and so the impression is made of an invasion and something illegal going on in the fact that Israel is even there at all. Um, this obviously fuels is is fueled by uh, by the commitment in some cases religious and in other cases probably. Uh, ethnic, that uh, that Israel shouldn't be there at all and doesn't have any right to be there at all uh, at any different level. So let's walk through uh, how we got to the state of Israel, if I can say it that way, and and the legal claims that she has uh, to the land. Uh, let's, In other words, let's set aside the Bible for a second and let's just talk legally from a secular point of view as, as anyone would look at this about Israel's right to be in the land. I am not uh, competent to really get into the legal background. I mentioned to you before the show uh, about a book by Howard Grief uh, that's uh, titled The Legal Foundation and Borders of Israel Under International Law. It's about a 700-page book that lays out the case uh, from a legal perspective. And you can't tell me in 90 seconds yeah, what those 700 right. pages say. <laughs> well, he goes back to the San Remo Peace Conference after World War I and mm-hmm. the breakup of the Ottoman Empire and just follows it right on through. Mm-hmm. Um, so there is a very solid legal case according to international law. As far as the purchase of land, this is an area of real contention. But beginning in the late 1800s, uh, the Jewish National Fund and other, other organizations were purchasing land from the Arab land owners. And they purchased actually quite a bit of land, mostly in the coastal plain, some in Galilee, and some along the Jordan Valley, especially toward the Dead Sea. The reason for these particular purchases was because this was land that was deemed worthless. Malarial swamps, land that was saturated with salt, um, land that had been so eroded it was covered with sand. These were worthless lands that were purchased cheaply by the Jewish National Fund. And then w- the swamps were drained, the land was, uh, was reclaimed, uh, the salt was leached out of the soil to produce agricultural land. Uh, so all of that took place uh, prior to the establishment of the State of Israel. Uh, there was the purchase of land. Only when Israel was attacked in 1948 by the surrounding nations uh, and Israel won that war uh, was additional land taken. Uh, Many of the Arabs who lived there were told by the surrounding nations to desert, to leave their homes and their properties because as soon as the Arab uh, forces drove the Jews into the sea, they would be able to claim not only their land and their homes, but the Jews' property as well. And so many left. Um, I believe there may be a legitimate right uh, to the spoils of a defensive war. I'm thinking in particular of the Golan Heights, uh, which Israel took in 1967. Uh, from the Golan Heights, they were under constant bombardment by the Syrians. In the Six-Day War, they took that land, not through aggression, 
but through fighting a defensive war. Mm -hmm. And uh, it added to the security of the state of Israel. So the point is, is that different pieces of land have come in to control the nation through a variety uh, of means, but the core um, the core presence of Israel as a state in the land is something that has gone through a very internationally recognized uh, process that some people have have uh, hesitated to accept and are trying to fight as a result. And that's where some of the language comes from that we see about about some of these conflicts. Uh, Mitch, what's your what's your take on on uh, on the roots of the state of Israel and the language that gets used as we talk about what's going on? It's a great discussion. I, um, again, appreciate everything that Jim added there. We have to remember that uh, Jordan, Iraq, Syria, I mean, all of these Af Arab countries were part of the, uh, for the most part, were part of the Ottoman Empire. It was broken up. They were redivided. There was no Jordan. Uh, there was no Israel, allegedly. And so you basically had uh, Western victorious powers dividing up. Uh, land and uh, and you have to see that uh, after a period of colonialization, you see that this a lot in South America and Africa as well. We're in a post-colonial period, which is uh, which is why there's just so much of this stuff going on. And Israel is almost like thrown into the mix of a lot of this post-colonial uh, uh, divisiveness and uh, contention. And you see this uh, all over the place. And if you don't understand this in terms of, uh, of a, the Arab Spring was, again, a response to a, po a post-colonial movement. That's why when everybody was saying, well, the Arab Spring is good because people will become more dem democratic and everything else, you know, I remember looking at my wife one day and I said, oh boy, this is not gonna go well for the Jews, you mm -hmm. know? And the, and the point was, I mean, even briefly, as a result of the Arab Spring, you had the Muslim Brotherhood coming to power in Egypt, you know? And so, uh, can you imagine if the Brotherhood was in power in Egypt right now, what would be going on in Gaza? And so, you have to understand that there's been this turf fighting for land. So, without the biblical perspective that the land belongs to the Jewish people, then it's one big political post-colonial uh, morass where everybody's trying to grab what they need. Secondly, on the issue of defense, I agree with Jim that the land that has been called the occupied uh, territory, occupied territories, all of that land uh, uh, came to Israel for the most part as a result of of war. At least uh, the Golan did, and uh, and and East Jerusalem uh, did. Um, and then I think it's very interesting to see that the one little piece of land that was populated by allegedly about 1.7 million uh, Palestinians that was given over to Palestine, totally to Palestinian rule, Gaza, where the Jewish people actually left. You know, nobody's debating about settlements in Gaza right now. There are not. You know, who would do that? And so the only place where there are no, quote unquote, settlements uh, is Gaza. And look what's happened there. And so with, with total removal and giving it over, it, uh, it, it, it basically uh, made that area of land and the population there vulnerable to Muslim extremists who have taken ripe advantage of this. And that has not only been bad for average Palestinians, it's been really bad for Christian Palestinians, and it's been bad for Israel. And so I think that a lot of the defensive um, actions of Israel, whether it be uh, Golan, whether it be East Jerusalem, uh, whether it be building a wall, whether it be checkpoints, uh, I understand that uh, that these are all very difficult for some of the more innocent Palestinians to to handle. And there was a day when a lot of these weren't there. But what happened? We had uh, a couple of intifadas. We had uh, Hamas come on the scene. And so right now, I don't see how Israel can rel relax its defense posture or how many tunnels are going to be built and how many Israelis are going to be killed. America would never tolerate this. Uh, Europe 
Europeans would never tolerate it. And, uh, and so we don't have a prospect for Israel relaxing her defense infrastructure, which is what is rubbing so many more neutral Palestinians the wrong way and rubbing a lot of Americans who really want the best for everybody, rubbing them the wrong way. They don't understand the connection between defense, uh, self-defense in Israel and, uh, and what's going on. So the only thing that can really happen right now is that Hamas has got to be stopped. And until Hamas is stopped, until that strain of fanatical extremists, fundamental militant Islam, until that is rooted out, um, you're just you're 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 not going to have any prospect for Israel relaxing its defenses. The U.S. never would do that. Yeah, I like to use the illustration. If you were sitting in Albany or Rochester, New York, and you had bombs coming at you from or rockets coming at you from Toronto and and from uh, uh, Buffalo and up from New York City, et cetera, and that were going on in the United States, Americans wouldn't put up for that with that for a second. Um, so uh, it is. I, I think it's it, you know part of what we're trying to do with this podcast is to put everything in a larger context so that people understand not just what they're seeing, the images that they're seeing on the television that are that are disturbing. There's no doubt about it, um, but also understanding the context about what's generating the nature of this conflict and what's going on. David, your your take on. Uh, on the language and, and kind of where we're at in terms of uh, uh, of these kinds of questions. Yeah, I would absolutely affirm everything that both Jim and, and Mitch just said. And I would add this, uh, and that is that the narrative of Palestinian nationalism is the most recent narrative to be created. And frankly, I believe it's a canard. It's based upon a false uh, ideology that's just simply designed to try and uh, delegitimize Israel's uh, claim to the land. Uh, the problem is that Israel has no negotiating partner on the other side, whether it be in, in the past, at the very beginning of this uh, Palestinian nationalist claim, you had uh, Yasser Arafat. And now you've got uh, Abu Mazen with the Palestinian Authority, who has n no real authority. And then you have Hamas, whose authority only is at the end of a rocket. And so there's really nothing that Israel has to do. And when they go to Egypt, the, 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 you know, they're trying to work out some sort of an agreement. But who's going to enforce the agreement from Gaza? or, you know, from Ramallah. It, it just doesn't, uh, it, it's not a fair negotiation from the start because Israel has the ability to keep its uh, commitments and uh, the Palestinians uh, don't have any, any intention to because it's written into their very charters to see Israel destroyed. And unless that gets changed and unless uh, Gaza is demilitarized, it's going to be a, cycle, a cycle of, of violence. And, and I want to say that in all of this, there is a real positive component that Christians need to realize, and that is that especially among uh, Israelis and younger Israelis, there's a, a, an unquenchable thirst for peace. And, you know, we don't see the emotional, psychological toll that it takes uh, on this population to have to be running into bomb shelters twice a day at a minimum with the children and the families all, you know, having to stop on the side of the road when the sirens go off. It's just an intolerable situation. And like you said, America would never put up with this. And yet Israel is living in, you know, to say it's a rough neighborhood is, you know, the understatement of the century. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, as, as Americans and Christians, need to recognize that this is an intolerable situation that has no legitimate negotiable uh, outcome uh, other than a truce. And yet there's this desire for peace. And in the midst of all of this, we have an obligation to bring the only hope for peace, who is Jesus, the Prince of Peace. And, uh, you know, from our perspective right now, the greatest openness to the gospel of any Jewish community in the world is among especially Israeli young people. 
And so we want to redouble our efforts, not only to preach the gospel there, but to recognize that when Arabs and Jews can say to one another, I love you in Jesus' name, the world will truly see the reconciling power of the gospel. And that is our hope today. Now, it, 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 I'm, you've got, I'm torn as to what direction to go because you've opened up, uh, uh, you know, how do, we, how do we move towards any kind of, uh, of resolution or are we stuck and locked in a cycle? And obviously, unless hearts are changed and attitudes are changed, we're seemingly locked into a pretty deep cycle here. Um, uh, th but there is one other question I want to tackle before I go there, and it's this. Um, how do we – how should Christians view uh, the plight, if I'm going to say it this way, of the average Palestinian? Um, I I'd hate to, for us to walk away from this podcast and simply say, well, this is – you know, here's, here's how you need to understand the situation that Israel is in. Fact is, the Middle East is a mess. And in being a mess, uh, there are a lot of people who are caught in the middle of what's going on here who uh, are, are being put in very uh, difficult situation and circumstances. And uh, I know all of you have been to Israel, and I, th I think uh, most of you have, have spent some time on both sides of the wall, if I can say it that way. So, um, uh, so how, do we, how, how do we think about the Palestinian who's there? And I have two groups in mind, the Palestinian Christians on the one hand, um, and then and then the average Palestinian on the other. What what should we? How, how should Christians think about about their plight in the midst of what it is that we've described, which obviously is a complex mess? Jim, well, uh, Darrell, we lived in Israel for almost almost fourteen years, and I had opportunity to develop good relationships, like you said, on both sides. Preached in in uh, Palestinian uh, Christian congregations, churches. Uh, and had many friends, uh, I still come back to what the Scripture says, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. Uh, for, for Israeli Arabs, there are many Israeli Arabs now who are a growing number, I understand, who are, who are recognizing that their future uh, really is with Israel. And some are beginning to serve in the Israel Defense Forces. Uh, they are really casting their lot in with Israel and turning their backs to other Palestinians who are who are striving for nationalism or whatever. And for the Muslim, for the Palestinian Muslim, if some way could be found for them to uh, lay down their hatred, their anti-Semitism, and find a way to peacefully coexist with Israel, I believe it would be the only way to lift them out of poverty and out of backwardness and into the 21st century. Uh, they could hitch their wagon to Israel's star. I just recently read a great book by George Gilder called The Israel Test, in which he, said, he makes this very point from a secular perspective, that if you really love uh, the Palestinians, uh, you need to help them to see that the way to prosperity, the way to liberty and freedom is by getting on board with what's happening in Israel. And I think biblically that fits as well. Uh, Mitch, what's your take on how we should view the Palestinian plight? Well, I still remember uh, a few years ago when a uh, guy in his early 30s who was the head of the uh, Palestinian Bible Society bookstore in Gaza, was dragged off, uh, two or three kids, was dragged off and, uh, and killed and, uh, by Muslim extremists. Uh, the population of Christians in Bethlehem has gone from, you know, it's dropped by 70 percent. I mean, every Palestinian Christian knows what's really going on. Basically, if Israel pulled out of Israel, if the Jews pulled out of Israel, and, uh, and Hamas and the Palestinian Authority took over, how soon thereafter do you think Sharia law would be established? And what would happen to the Christians? The same thing that's happening to the Christians in Syria and Iraq and so on. So the Palestinian believers need our compassion yes, uh, because they're between a rock and a hard place. Uh, they understand they do have loyalties as Palestinians, and they do carry uh, some of the narrative and agenda. Uh, it's even more difficult for those that believe Israel does have a right to the land, theologically. 
but they're faced with if they support their uh, the Palestinians, if they support Gaza, if they support the uh, Palestinian Authority, and and they throw in well, their future is very dismal. And I think the average, more secular Muslim feels the same way. Uh, before the intifadas began, uh, people were had thriving construction businesses. They were in college and university. I mean, things were really pretty normal. But then this whole post-colonial, extreme Islamic militaristic agenda has swept through the whole Middle East, including Israel. And I think it scares the daylights out of the average Palestinian. I think they're terrified. They're more terrified of what's going to happen if uh, Israel doesn't have anything to do uh, with them than if they did. There's a lot of talk about Hamas leaders being corrupt. And, you know, there's always political corruption on, on all sides. But I think that uh, certainly we know that with, uh, Arafat's bank accounts were huge. And so uh, I think that that's a problem. I would make one suggestion to the brothers and sisters listening. And that is without buying in to all of these agendas and with proper concern for your own safety. I think that a time for humanitarian relief on the part of Christians uh, in Gaza is really acute. And I, I believe that it would be a, a great thing for Christians to mobilize and to be a presence within Gaza uh, for relief work because it's going to take billions of dollars and it's going to take so much work to put Gaza back together again. And as much as I do not want to see, uh, or let's put it the other way, as much as I want to see Hamas and Gaza demilitarized, I also think that Gaza needs to be rebuilt so that its citizens can have a good life. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I would think Christians should consider what they could do to help Gaza. David? Yeah, there's no question that as followers of Jesus, we have to demonstrate that loving Israel does not mean hating Arabs. That's right. And we have to have a very reliable opportunity to demonstrate that. Uh, that's the problem right now. As we know, a lot of the aid that came in after Operation Cast Lead in the form of cement and other building supplies ended up being used to make the tunnels by Hamas. And so to find a way to provide the humanitarian aid that is so desperately needed without, you know, knowing that it's not going to be used, uh, you know, for other means, that's the challenge we have yet to, to uncover. I would also say, however, that there are genuine efforts to bring about uh, some uh, platform for reconciliation between younger Arabs uh, and Jews. Uh, a ministry that I would commend named called Musalaha that tries to bring Arabs and Jews together. Uh, they go out into the desert, uh, they break bread together, they sleep under the stars together, and they discuss their lives in a biblical framework. Sometimes the participants are believers, sometimes they're not. Uh, but there are efforts like that underway to establish a peace and a sense of uh, a basis for reconciliation and wherever we as believers in Jesus can affirm that, can encourage that, can um, use, if you will, this current conflict as a theological laboratory for demonstrating that the gospel is a gospel of peace, that it has implications beyond just the proclamation of the good news, but actually works toward bringing people together reconciled first to God and then to one another. These are efforts that are really worth Christians investing their resources in. Now, um, I want to kind of begin to wrap up, and I want to do it with two questions here at the end, and that is, what, uh, what would you say to people in terms of what we can be likely to expect? I mean, I'm not going to make you into a prophet, but I want you to think about uh, realistically what we could expect from the region. And then the last question is, uh, and, and what kind of hope um, do we have as we as we look at the current situation? And David, I'm going to start with you, and then go to Mitch, and then Jim, I'll let you wrap up. Um, David, how how would you respond to uh, you know what we can expect, and and then where's the hope? Well, if the Bible is our guide, then we can expect that the conflict will continue 
And yet, in the midst of it will be a great opportunity for the gospel. And I really believe that's what we can count on. And we're beginning to see right now the, 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 the first fruits of that final harvest. Uh, I never would have imagined 10 years ago that the largest branch office of Jews for Jesus in the world would be in Tel Aviv. And yet now we have 25 Israelis they're actively going out preaching the gospel, trying to be a good witness. The other day they were down handing out uh, copies of psalms and bags of candy to soldiers going to the front lines of the conflict. And there's, a, as I said before, a greater openness to the gospel among Israeli young people than any other group of Jewish people that we're ministering to in the world. And so as believers in Jesus, we need to recognize that this conflict, I believe, will continue in one form or another until Christ returns. But the obligation of the church is to preach the gospel to Jews and to Arabs in the Middle East, and that's where we need to focus our efforts. And that is a very hopeful prospect. We had a group of uh, American Jewish believers out on the streets uh, on Rothschild the other day, and they were they had a uh, big uh, posters up that had a, a map of the world and it said peace, P-E-A-C-E, -E, by peace, uh, P-I-E-C-E. -E. So, and they were inviting Israelis to come up and put their hopes for peace. And uh, it provided a tremendous opportunity for conversation with these Israeli young people that were out there hanging out, trying to live a normal life in the midst of the sirens going off. And like I said, the evidence is that there's a tremendous hunger for peace. And there's a sense of, uh, you know, despair over the inability of the leadership on either side to find a path toward peace. And we know that real peace, lasting peace, begins in the heart through the transformation of the work of the Holy Spirit in the gospel. And that really is, as simple as it may sound, the only hope for peace. And that's what, as Christians, looking for realistic ways to provide relief, need to make the major focus, and that is the proclamation of the gospel of peace in that land. And God will answer our prayers, and we will see Jews and Arabs come together in the name of Jesus. Mitch? What do you think we're headed for, and where's the hope? I, I think that we're going to continue to see uh, armed conflict for years to come. I believe that uh, the only possible way, as long as you have extreme, radical, militarized uh, groups of people, uh, that the only way that Israel can protect itself is by continuing to have a strong defense. And I know that the IDF will have a lot of self-reflection, they always do, after these kinds of, of uh, uh, operations. Um, I think, thank God, uh, 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 there has not been incursions from the north, just very minimal. But if there's ever a moment of peace in that area, that could open up a whole other front as well. We don't know about the stability of Jordan at this point. There's a lot of pressure on, on, on them. And so I think that, just being honest, for years to come, I think that there's going to uh, continue to be difficulty. Uh, whether or not, uh, I'm not an expert, so I don't really want to get into whether a two-state solution or some other form of a one-state solution or all these other possibilities, but I don't think anything is a possibility as long as radical militants with a disregard for human life, are in charge of the political process. I think they want what they want. They want the land, and they want the Jews out, and they want it, and they want a Muslim country. And that goes against uh, the ideals of the nation of Israel, and uh, same with America. When it comes to hope, my hope is that uh, Israel will uh, be level-headed. Israel will be measured. My hope is that Israel will maintain a strong defense. My hope is that Britain and uh, I think Spain and some other countries will uh, not be as influenced by their own uh, local populations of uh, more radical and militant uh, Muslims and that they will uh, sell arms to Israel. I, I, I hope that uh, I think a strong Israel is good 
for Jews, it's good for non-militant Palestinians, and it's really good for the West. I think that we have a vested interest. I think, unfortunately, some of the more, I have to use the word because I'm a Jewish New Yorker and I live there, but some of the more uh, liberal uh, elements of our own society um, are, even at heart, to some degree, they're uncomfortable with democracy. They're sometimes they're anti-West, and I think that those va- those values are creeping into their uh, positions. And so, my hope is that they have very limited uh, impact and influence on our own government. Uh, what is our hope? Our chosen people has been ministering in Israel since before Israel was a, a country. Remember, we're 121 years old, and so. Uh, we've been we've been everywhere for a long time, and we we're doing a lot of things again. And uh, and so our work in Israel has been uh, very active, and we have uh, a lot of missionaries there, mostly Israelis. And uh, one of the areas that we've been very sensitive to, because some on our staff are Russian Jews, and uh, uh, a number of them have come from families of Holocaust survivors, and so on. There's still a little, uh, little around 200,000, be a little under 200,000 Holocaust survivors in Israel. The majority of them actually speak Russian. The majority of them came over uh, after perestroika, and uh, because they survived by fleeing from, to Russia from Hungary and Poland and other parts of the former Soviet Union, and we've had a tremendous ministry among them. But I'm thinking most particularly of the people in Sederot, which is a town right adjacent to Gaza, about a mile and a half, two miles away. And you have uh, uh, hundreds, maybe a few thousand, very elderly Russian Jewish Holocaust survivors who have been living through basically a living hell uh, because of Gaza, not just now, but they've been enduring this for almost 14 years. And so, uh, or close to it. And so, They've been living uh, uh, under threat of rockets, and uh, we've had a great ministry to them. But one of our best ministries, we just, right now, we have 35 of these people from Sederot and a few other cities, Ashkelon and Ashdod. They're in Poland, believe it or not. Uh, it was very difficult to find a safe place in Israel for them. Hmm. They're, the average age is about 80, and uh, you, you haven't seen anything. You've seen them try and make it to a, bus sh- a, a bomb shelter within 15 seconds. And s- so we've had to take them out. And Polish Christians, and of course it's a twist of fate because um, uh, so many of the Poles were uh, anti-Semitic and, and uh, worked in concert with the Nazis. Uh, but we have such a great group of Polish evangelicals who are loving on these Holocaust survivors. And so they're out there for two weeks and um, having Bible studies and just getting a rest from all the tension. And so I think that the hope in Israel is the hope that's everywhere. I agree with David. The hope is always Jesus. It's always, always the gospel. And so I see minimal hope politically. I see a lot of hope when it comes to the gospel, because when life is difficult and times are hard, people are looking to solutions from outside this world for their problems. And so Israelis, young and old, right now, many of them are looking to God and thank uh, the Lord we're able to bring the message of the Prince of Peace on the ground to Israelis. And we just really need to pray that Israelis will come to faith. And that is our best hope. Jim? Well, I agree with David and Mitch uh, as well. I think I would put it in terms of good news, bad news. And the bad news is that Israel is not dealing with just Palestinian nationalism. Uh, As David mentioned earlier, there really is a spiritual dimension here. When uh, Yasser Arafat died in his compound were found huge stacks of Mein Kampf uh, translated into Arabic. Um, most of these groups all around Israel are really infected with a very deep uh, anti-Semitism. 
that's a spiritual issue that has to be dealt with. So bad news, I don't see the prospects for um, peace anytime soon uh, until, of course, as Scripture tells us, Antichrist comes and offers a false peace for a period of time. And one of the reasons it will be so astounding is because the world will have given up all hope for peace political peace. And I think that's the process. That's where we're, we're heading. Uh, all hope has not been killed yet, but it's, we're almost there. Mm. Uh, but on the other hand, there's good news. The good news is that peace is breaking out in the Middle East. It's breaking out in the hearts and lives of individuals, both Arab and Jew, who are turning to Jesus and finding there the peace for which they long. You know, at the core of the gospel is not just the hope of a reestablished relationship with God, but ultimately, as well, a reconciliation that happens between people who are estranged not only from God but from one another, and that is at the core of uh, of uh, of the the result of what it means to respond to the gospel. So, unless there is a a really significant change of heart, uh, it's going to be very hard to change uh, the situation on the ground. I want to thank you all for taking the time to talk with us, being very realistic about what's going on, giving some detail and background. Uh, it strikes me we've spent just slightly over an hour talking about this, and we literally have only scratched the surface. I can think of 20 questions in the back of my head I'd still want to ask. So. I